very sad and very strange here at St John's uh, Church in Leyland this morning to be in front of a nearly empty church and uh, not to have a congregation physically in front of us. And yet, at the same time, it's a great joy to know that through the, the wonders of technology, actually more of you are able to gather together, uh, as it were, virtually, uh, and to worship with us than we'll be able to gather safely in person at the moment. I want to extend a particular welcome to anyone watching us as part of the morning service from the Diocese of Blackburn. We hope you enjoy worshipping with us this morning. For anyone who doesn't know me, my name's Sue Champness. I'm a licensed lay minister here at St John's Leyland. And our vicar, Reverend Andy Meeson, will be bringing us the message from the letter of James later in this service. Just before we, or, or as we begin our worship, let's uh, pause for a moment of silence and then I'll pray. Father God, we praise you that you are a God who is present with us, that you came to be with us uh, in Jesus and that through Jesus we can come into your presence just as we are as your children. We praise you that by your spirit you are able to be with each one of us this morning, wherever we are, whatever we're facing, however we're feeling. And we ask that you would help us to be open to you, open to hear the things that you have to say to us by your spirit, and ready to respond uh, with the worship of our hearts, not just through the words that we say and sing together this morning, but also in the way that we live our lives going forward as people who long to respond to the God who loves us and has uh, come in Jesus to save us. We ask it in his precious name. Amen. So those of you who are regulars of, of St John's will know that we're partway through a series looking at the letter of James. And uh, last week, we were, Andy borrowed a, a phrase, just do it, coming from James chapter 1, verse 22, that tells us to not merely listen to the word, but to do what it says. And doing what God's word says isn't just about uh, practical actions, though it definitely is about practically showing love and helping others, but it's also about offering our praise to God in all sorts of different ways, including through singing. And one of the things that we can do uh, when we're not here in church, uh, here, here physically in church, we're not allowed to, to sing. But those of you watching at home, uh, hopefully, as long as your, your family or neighbours don't object too much, you can, be, you can sing out. So we're going to start, uh, have now, a, a, a fam hopefully a familiar hymn of praise, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And so I'd encourage you, if you're able to, to sing along.
my favorite lines from that song is the one that says, well, our feeble frame he knows. And we were thinking last week, uh, after that uh, comment from James about um, not just hearing the word, but doing what it says, about how God's word can be like a mirror. And that sometimes as we, we look into the mirror of God's word, he can point out to us uh, the things that, that need changing. Just as if you look in a mirror normally in the morning and you see a you know, mucky mark on your face or your hair's out of place, you can take action to do something about it. Uh, and in the same way, James says, as we look into God's words, uh, we need to allow his spirit to, to hold a mirror up to our insides. And so I'm going to ask us to just spend a few moments in quiet, asking God to do that, to, to hold a mirror to our hearts, if you like, uh, to show us if there's areas that he wants us to, to bring before him and ask for his help to change. And so having done that, let's uh, say together the words uh, on the screen now, saying, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us our sins and help us to change. Amen. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. And now our Bible reading this morning is going to be read for us by Tracy, a member of the congregation here, and then Andy is going to come and help us think more about that passage together. The reading is taken from James, chapter 2, starting at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in different directions? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me add my welcome to Sue's. It's great to have you joining us today. And let me lead us in a prayer as we look at God's word more closely now. Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and inclinations of all of our hearts may be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to start by reading a short poem by Michael Green based on Jesus' words in Matthew 25. 
I was hungry. And you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. I was imprisoned, and you crept off quietly to your chapel in the cellar and prayed for my release. I was naked, and in your mind you debated the morality of my appearance. I was sick, and you knelt and thanked God for your health. I was homeless, and you preached to me the spiritual shelter of the love of God. I was lonely, and you left me alone to pray for me. You seem so holy, so close to God, but I'm still very hungry and lonely and cold. The religion described in that poem, in the assessment of James's strongly worded letter that we just had read to us, is worthless. The faith described in that poem, according to James in this strongly worded letter, is useless, is dead. They're pretty shocking words, aren't they, to hear and to start with. And in one sense, this is a rather shocking letter. James confronts the complacent, the idle, the hypocritical with a big kick up the backside as he describes what mature, true, complete Christianity looks like. Last week, we heard that call from James to not only be hearers of God's word, but doers as well. And in today's reading, we hear what real faith does and does not look like. And James tells us that real faith works. Real faith is lived out in a transformed life. Real faith leads to action and works and deeds. James tells us real faith works. Does yours? That's what we're thinking about. Have a look with me if you've got a Bible with you at verse 14. James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Verse 17, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Verse 24, you see a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Or verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. According to James, a faith that does not work, does not work. He says it's a faith that cannot save, a faith that does not justify, a faith that is dead. Now, it's really, really important that we don't misunderstand what James is saying here. Because if you've been around St. John's any period of time, and I hope whoever you are watching around the diocese, um, you have heard that the good news of Christianity the good news of Jesus, the good news of the gospel is that we are saved, we are made right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The way that I often put it is that our confidence, our assurance, our salvation is not based on what we have done, but in what Christ has done for us. But what James is asking here is that faith in Jesus, that faith in what he has done, that faith that justifies, what does that faith look like? So you see, James is not necessarily pitting faith against works. What James is doing here, and you need to look at me for this one, he's pitting faith against faith, in inverted commas. We see that in verse 14, if you look at that again. He says, if someone claims to faith, 
but has no deeds. Can such a faith, can that kind of faith save them? He's contrasting real faith with this fake faith. And he's, he's teaching us how to distinguish the two. And James takes a very, very simple approach to this. In James's mind, if something looks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, then it's probably a duck. But if something has a wet nose and two floppy ears, it barks and it wheezes on lamp posts, that ain't a duck. That's something else. And he's saying real faith. What does real faith sound like? What does real faith sound like? What does real faith do? Real faith works. It does yours. Real faith leads to a life of faith. That's what our vision here is at St. John's, isn't it? We exist to live, loving, knowing, and sharing Jesus with the whole of our lives. Real faith leads to a transformed life of action. Real faith leads to a transformed life of love. Real faith leads to a transformed life of service and obedience, of doing what God has said. Now, James gives loads of examples through this letter. We saw last week the example of our words and how we speak about people and to people. Last week we thought about how we care for those who are vulnerable and needy, and he draws our attention to that here again in verse 15. And we're going to hear many more examples of this. But at the moment, James wants to make sure that we've got the theology right of what is going on here. And he wants us to understand that real faith works. The Reformation of the 16th century was uh, really the, the great rediscovery of the doctrine of justification by faith alone, being made right with God through our faith alone. But even as they emphasize that they never wanted to lose what James was saying here and so one of the famous reformed maxims was faith alone justifies but not that faith which is alone or Martin Luther for example spoke of faith being a living creative active and powerful thing he said this faith cannot help doing good works constantly It doesn't stop to ask if good works ought to be done, but before anyone asks, it already has done them and continues to do them without ceasing. He's making the same point there that James is making here, that a faith without a changed life, a faith without deeds, without action, without works, is, verse 17, dead. Is, verse 20, useless. It's an empty phantom. Which means for us today that faith in Jesus is more than just knowing the right things and saying the right things. It's more than just being able to say say the creed. Verse uh, 19, he says, even the, de- even the demons know there's one God, but at least they do something about it. At least they shudder at the thought. He's saying our faith in that one God needs to lead to action. Now James is trying to convince his audience of the truth of what he's saying, and so he goes, very naturally, to the Old Testament. He gives two examples, Rahab and Abraham. Now we're just going to focus on what he's saying about Abraham here. And we're going to focus on that because often it can get a bit confusing quite what James is saying and what he's drawing from Abraham's example here. If you've ever read through the, Old, the New Testament, you will know that the Apostle Paul also goes to the example of Abraham to make a point about how Abraham was made right with God, was declared righteous through not what he did, but through his faith. God made an incredible promise in Genesis 19. Abraham believed in that promise, and it was credited to him as righteousness, we're told. Now, at first reading, it seems that James might be saying something a bit different. Verse 21, he says, Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did? And we think, that seems a bit strange. But actually, I want us to see that James is not disagreeing with what Paul has said, but he's making a slightly different point. 
He's, he's assuming Abraham is made right with God through faith, but now he's asking, well, what does that faith actually look like? What impact did that have on Abraham's life? So verse 23, have a look. He takes us back to Genesis 15, when God made this unbelievable promise, and Abraham believed God, and he was put into that right relationship with God. He became friends with God. He was declared righteous. But, verse 22, have a look. That faith was not left alone. It expressed itself, it manifested itself in in his works. So that James can then go to a point later on in Abraham's life, in Genesis 22, which he speaks about in verse 21 there, where that faith led to action, led to obedience. It led to doing what God said, even when it seemed completely crazy. So that is what James is trying to prove to us from Abraham. Verse 21 and 24, he's saying a a person's righteousness, a person's faith, a person's salvation, it's it's manifested, it's, it's demonstrated in what they do, in a transformed life. And it's very important for us to get that cause and effect right and not get things the wrong way around. When I go out on my bike and the wind is blowing me sideways across the road, which is quite an achievement, particularly after a cake stop, and I look up at the wind turbines and they're spinning around, as I ride on my bike, I don't say, oh, if all these wind turbines weren't spinning, there wouldn't be all this wind blowing me around. That's to get the cause and effect the wrong way around, isn't it? The wind turbines are spinning because the wind is blowing. Same way with Abraham. He he obeyed, he he had a transformed life, he worked because of his faith, because of that salvation, because of what God had done for him. And it's the same with us. When we put our faith in Jesus and our hearts are allured and captured and transformed by that good news, that faith isn't just left alone, that manifests itself in works, in action in a changed life. Jesus said the same in John 14. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And a faith that truly loves Jesus, that's been captivated by his beauty and his glory and his grace and his mercy, well, then we will obey. We will be changed. Real faith works does yours. So as we close, where does that leave us today then? Where does that leave us? Well, a guy called Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said this. He said, only those who obey can believe. And only those who believe can obey. Only those who obey can believe and only those who believe can obey. So let me say to you, if after hearing these words of James, you're left thinking, well, I do believe. I do love Jesus. I am trusting in him and what he's done for me. Well, then James, obey. Because real faith works. It needs to be shown out in our life. But if, as you've heard James' words here, you've been convicted in your heart that actually, you know what, I know there's an area of my life that I'm not obeying in. I know there's an area of my life that I'm not allowed to be transformed. I know there's an area of of God's word that I'm ignoring and that I'm not listening to. Well, then James says, well, then believe. Look again at Jesus and what he has done for you. Look again at the good news of his grace and let your heart be captivated and changed and transformed by it. And as you do, and as God gives you that faith, then you will be able to obey. Because real faith works. Does yours. Amen.
So we come now to the part of our service where we do declare our faith. And um, we're going to use the words of the Apostles' Creed, an ancient statement of Christian faith. But in the light of what we've just been hearing, I've decided to, uh, to use a form where the creed, if you like, is split into three sections. And I'll ask a question before each as to whether we believe. And then after we've responded together, I'm going to leave just a short pause for silence, just for us to reflect on the fact, do we really believe this? And if we do, are we allowing God to shape the way we live in response to what we believe? So do you believe and trust in God the Father? I, I believe, believe in, in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty creator, creator of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy, Holy Catholic, Catholic Church, Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And it is important that we're able to say what we believe and, and prepared to, to speak it publicly, particularly if we think in the context of, of what I'm, uh, we're going to spend a few minutes thinking about now before we come to our time of uh, prayers of intercession, which is to hear a little bit more from one of the organisations we support uh, as a church family here at St John's, which is Open Doors, who work to support Christians in contexts of persecution around the world. And for many of them, the willingness to publicly state their belief in God the Father, in Jesus Christ who, who died for us uh, in the Holy Spirit is something that actually puts them in some cases at risk of being put at the end of the line for receiving aid with the open doors of shared stories of, of Christians even through this COVID crisis who um, have not received, not been given, had had ration cards uh, torn up for, for government aid because of their faith in Christ. Uh, and in some cases, worse than that, suffering, uh, imprisonment, even death. And this week, Open Doors uh, produced their World Watch List for 2021, which is a list of the 50 countries around the world where to hold that faith in Christ that we've just declared together uh, is something that puts people in great danger. And uh, so we're going to uh, watch a short video clip now that just says a little bit more about the work of Open Doors and challenges us as to how we might respond in the situation that so many of our brothers and sisters around the world face. What if your church had to meet in secret? What if spies watched your every move? What if following Jesus meant you faced violence or even death? Millions of Christians around the world experience these kinds of challenges every day. And these are the top 10 countries where faith costs the most. Number 10, India. Hindu extremists want to rid India of Christians and they are prepared to use extreme violence to achieve their goal. At number nine, Nigeria where more Christians are murdered for their faith than in any other country in the world. Iran is at number eight. Secret house churches risk being raided by the police 
If caught, be prepared for a long prison sentence. Number seven, Yemen, a war-torn country where Christians, if discovered, face the death penalty. Eritrea is at number six. If your faith is discovered, you can be imprisoned without trial in appalling conditions. Often, your loved ones don't even know if you're still alive. Number five, Pakistan. Say the wrong thing in Pakistan, and the notorious blasphemy laws could see you accused of insulting Islam and sentenced to death. At number four is Libya, a lawless land with no freedom of speech or belief. Somalia is number three on the list. Somali Christians can't reveal their faith to anyone or they could be killed, even by their own families. Number two is Afghanistan. If they find out you're a Christian, you have a stark choice. Flee the country or be killed. And at number one, North Korea, the most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian. Informants are everywhere. Discovery means death, either by execution or by being worked to death in a labor camp. At least 340 million Christians around the world experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. What if you could help them? For 65 years, Open Doors has stood alongside the persecuted church, strengthening Christians who dare to follow Jesus, no matter the cost. Your prayers and gifts enable our underground networks to reach millions of Christians with emergency food and aid, spiritual care, smuggled Bibles and Christian books, training and legal advice. But more than that, your support means that persecuted Christians know that they are not forgotten, not alone. After all, these are not strangers and they are not statistics. They are our brothers and sisters and they need our help. So in the light of what we've just heard there, isn't it, and, and in what we heard earlier from, from the letter of James, isn't it good to be able to partner with organisations such as Open Doors who are putting faith into action just as our brothers and sisters are, um, but the organisation that is actually doing practical things, as you saw there, to be able to support those who are willing to endure so much because of their real faith in Jesus. And I would commend the Open Doors website to you. Um, as I said, so we, we saw there a summary of the top 10 countries. There's a, a list of, of 50, uh, and it gives us more information so that we can be better informed, uh, better able to pray for our brothers and sisters. But also, they, part of the, the point of, of producing this list each year is so that Open Doors can raise awareness with those in influence, those in power. So it was great when they launched the list earlier this week, or earlier last week, um, it was at a parliamentary gathering. Uh, because of the restrictions, they had to do it on Zoom, but still there were, uh, I think, over 90 uh, members of Parliament who were there for the launch of that list to hear about uh, the discrimination against people because of their, their faith and belief around the world and to urge our government to, to make a difference. And so that's something we can, we can pray for as well. And there's opportunities through the Open Doors website to write to your Member of Parliament to ask them to support um, the the aims of, of that list in terms of thinking about where our aid goes as a country and, and whether uh, questions can be raised, where there are um, countries that uh, don't support people's rights to freedom of belief. Um, and so there's, there's that aspect of their advocacy work. Uh, there's also the opportunity to give, as you heard there, and to pray. And, and actually with that World Watch list for each of those 50 countries, there's some very simple, helpful information and prayers that can be used. And uh, one of the, the prayers for one of those countries for Pakistan is going to be uh, used in our prayers now, which are going to be led for us by the Meeson family, uh, recorded earlier. And so let's turn now to a time of prayer. Let's pray. 
Father God, we pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who suffer persecution because of their faith in you. We pray for those who have to worship you in secret for fear of persecution. Lord God, we pray especially for those in Pakistan where it seems almost impossible to follow you. But we know that with you all things are possible. Please draw close to these men, women and children and we ask that you would show them your love, steadfastness and power. Amen. 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 Father God, please help those who have COVID to get better soon. We pray for families who have lost loved ones and ask that you would be with them. We pray for wisdom for the government as they make rules for COVID. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Father God, we have said that we can't meet at church at the moment. But thank you for Zoom and other things that help us to connect. We pray for our bishops and church leaders to keep trusting you during these difficult times. Amen. Amen. And Father God, we want to pray for the NHS, which is in crisis at the moment. Lord God, we ask that there would be enough resources for the people that need it. We pray that those who need treatment will be able to access it. And we pray for NHS staff who are um, seeing so much at the moment. Lord, we ask that you would give them energy for each shift that they do. We thank you for their commitment and care. And we just pray that you would help them to be resilient and that they would keep going. Lord God, we thank you for the vaccine and that many people have now had it. And we ask that the rolling out of the vaccine would be swift and efficient so that many more may have it soon. We long for the day when there will be no more sickness or sadness, no more needs for vaccines or hospitals. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us going with our eyes firmly fixed on you until that time. Amen. Amen. Dear God, thank you that you made the, the world. Please help us to look after it. Please help us to protect endangered animals. Please help us to protect endangered animals. So they don't become extinct. And they don't go, and come extinct. Please come back soon. Please. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we're going to close with the vision prayer. Heavenly Father, we embrace your call for us to make disciples, to be witnesses, to grow leaders, and inspire children and young people. Give us eyes to see your vision ears to hear the prompting of your spirit and courage to follow in the footsteps of your son our lord and savior jesus christ amen, amen. so our closing hymn that i hope you'll be able to join in with again at home is one that encourages us as a church because of the real faith and hope that we have uh, in, in Jesus, to arise, to praise God and to worship him with all of our lives. So let's sing together, O Church, Arise.
thank you so much for joining us for this service of worship today. Uh, if you're a member of St. John's Congregation, I hope you received my congregation letter in the week. Uh, just to draw your attention to that, if you've not looked at it, uh, we've got some feedback from our most recent PCC meeting, uh, particularly some exciting news about uh, our subgroups. And so I would ask you to, uh, to read that and to respond appropriately to it. But now let me close with a prayer of blessing. May God Almighty send us out by his Spirit to live a life of real faith that works for the coming of the Kingdom of Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.